So Genesis chapter 26, and tonight's theme is humility. So as I said, uh, I s begin to study the story of, of Isaac here and added five more commentaries and just reading the, the context again uh, as I taught years ago this, this book and nothing much has changed on it, but I thought about his humility and why God blessed him, why God used him. And you see that humility in his life. And then you start thinking about all the people God uses and you realize they're, they're humble people. Uh, they're broken people. They're people that um, are honest with who they are. They're not deceiving themselves. They know that they're sinners. They know they make mistakes. And God sees that heart. And he blesses that. I had my car fixed from someone that had uh, bumped it with their car door and so went through the process of their insurance and had it uh, worked on. Well, when I first took it over to the place to get fixed, I went to pick up my rental car and they had basically lied to me, telling me that you'll be in and out within 15 minutes. I get there, and the guy says, sit down. It's, it's going to be at least an hour. And I says, I don't have an hour. And that means it's more than an hour, and I definitely don't have two hours. He says, I apologize, but we have no cars, and we're looking for cars. We're totally out of cars. So I'm like, now you're talking three hours. And I just says, no, I'll just come back later. Went back to the shop, picked up my car, and took off. So then I went and took it. Um, this week and I called the week before and says look this is what happened and I want to make sure you have a car for me and I can get into that car within 15 minutes and be on my way oh yeah guarantee that has never happened before uh, I, we apologize we're really sorry the, you know you'll come in we'll have a car ready 15 minutes we'll have you out so I said okay great send me a confirmation they send me a confirmation but it's for Ontario so then I call back up. I said, you have me going to Ontario. It's right here in Norco. Oh, we apologize. Okay, so reset the whole thing. And here's the confirmation. Okay, great. So I'll, I go in the following week. And I bring my car in. And I get there. And the guy says, oh, sit down. It's going to be a while. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. I'm not sitting down, first of all. I spoke with Lewis. And Lewis guaranteed me that it will be 15 minutes. And Lewis would say, yeah, what's your name? And so I gave him my name. He goes, well, it's going to be a while. I said, that's not what you said. And so I was getting a little little upset, you know, because they said something. I prearranged it, and they weren't true to their word. And so I was like, Lewis, and I went through the whole story, and just speaking right to him, you lied to me because it's happening again. And then I told him, I've got a funeral to prepare for, and then give about a 22-year-old man was, who was hit, and then the guy ran off. And they just looked at me like, okay, we'll, we'll get you in the car. And they had it in five minutes. Got me in the car and I was off. That's not humility. They weren't honest with themselves. They were lying, trying to appease someone that may have been a firecracker in a sense, you know, that hopefully they don't blow up. But that's not humility. But the manager who was standing right there never said a word. He called me. Well, I was on my way home and he said, I want to apologize because I heard the whole conversation. I was listening and we have totally misrepresented ourselves. We did not treat you right. We did not keep our promises. So whatever you want, we're here for you. You just tell us what you need and we'll give it to you. You know, like, well, what are you going to tell him you need? Well, I need a million dollars. How about that? You know, I mean, what, are you, what are you really saying? Uh, another week of your rent? You know, I don't know. But I says, no, I just needed to get out. And that was it. Just keep your word. Just keep your word. But unfortunately, we live in a society that, that it's okay to lie, you know, and cheat and steal as long as you can get away with it. And that's not humility. So as I was looking up the word humility, the biblical word of humility, I found Proverbs 15.33. You might want to write this down, but it says, Before honor, before honor is humility. Before honor is humility. In other words, if you're looking for honor from people, if you're looking for respect, if you're looking for people to esteem you, you have to be a humble person. People are drawn to humility. People will respect a person that's humble. 
People will esteem someone that is not a liar, a cheater, pushy, because they see that as a good characteristic in an individual. Peter said this, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Let that sink in for a little bit. <laughs> an elder is an elder person. Younger is a younger person than an older person. And it says you're to submit to your elders. Now, Peter could be talking about the leadership in the church as elders in that position. But either way, if you're younger than the elders, you are to submit to them. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. We're to put on humility. Whether an elder or whether a younger, we're to put on humility. Clothed with it, he said. We're to wear it because God resists the proud and gives what? Grace to the humble. He resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And that's why Isaac was given grace because he was humble. In the Bible, humility or humbleness is a quality of being courteous, respectful of others. Boy, do, do we miss that today? That is just out of our vocabulary, out of our nature and our society about being courteous and respectful to others. There was a time when, when you shook hands and you made a deal. I mean, it was set in concrete. You wouldn't back out of that deal. There was a time when we used to say, yes, sir, no, sir. I could remember some of my cousins and friends when they went home, they would talk to their parents that way, yes, sir, and no, sir. And we've kind of lost some of that respect and courtesy to one another, allowing women to walk in first, you know, in line and opening up doors and letting other people go in and, and so forth. Now, this is, this is convicting. It's convicting to me, but this is what humility means biblically. It is the opposite of aggressiveness, arrogance, boastfulness, and vanity. It's the opposite of those things. It was Chip Ingram who said, I know for me, going back to the person I've badmouthed or lied to is absolutely humiliating. But isn't it interesting that humiliating has the same root word as humility? Part of the humility is taking responsibility for my sin and asking forgiveness even when it doesn't feel good. God wants to heal and restore our relationships, but it's not easy. The person that sins needs to be humbled by going and making things right with those that they have wronged. That's humility. Rather than me first, humility allows us to say, no, you're first. You're first. Humility is a quality that lets us go more than halfway to meet the needs and demands of others. And not just sometimes, but all the time. John Newton said, I'm persuaded that love and humility are the highest attainments in the school of Christ and the brightest evidence that he is indeed our master. And so if you know Christ and he is your master, then there is a desire to walk like him. And he is the perfect example of what humility is. He was not aggressive. He thought of others more highly than he thought of himself. And we forget that. I have forgotten that. I have forgotten that. I was reading an article today about a, a pastors again. I guess it's getting close to October, right? Because that's Pastors Appreciation Month. And you start seeing all these articles uh, going in and, and so forth. And I appreciate that we don't really push that here because it's not about the pastor. It's about the work. But this article was basically uh, uh, talking about five things that the congregation needs to know about their pastor. And, and a couple of them that I just remember uh, from just thinking about is one is that um, as a congregant, he doesn't work for you. He doesn't work for you. He is not an employee. He works for God. God is his employer. And the point was is that people look at pastors as though they work for them because we pay them. And so we have a certain right to them and we expect them to do certain things because they're our pastor. And that's not true. They don't work for you. They don't even 
They're, they're really not even to minister to you, is another point. Well, who they minister to? To the Lord. And, and the Bible tells that in the Old Testament. There are good shepherds and bad shepherds, and the shepherds that are good are those that minister to the Lord first. They have a relationship with God first. But we expect, we expect these things because we're not humbled. We don't have that humility. What we truly need to remember is that the body of Christ is to be equipped for the work of the ministry. So God calls those pastors and teachers to equip the saints, what? So that they can go to hospital visits, so they can pray for one another because that is the ministry. And really, you should be going to one another to seek out prayer. You should be ministering to one another when you're sick. I mean, perfect example is what's been going on with Forrest's family. I, I haven't made one meal for them. They wouldn't want my meal anyway. <laughs> it wouldn't be very good. But who has made the meals for them these past two weeks? The body of Christ has. They have been ministering to them by bringing them the food. That's how it works. Who's been praying for them? Because I haven't been going over there and praying with them every night. But those who have been bringing the food and praying for them. That's how the body works. But unfortunately there are those that sit back. That's the pastor's job. He needs to go over there and pray for them. No, that's all our jobs. Including mine. That's how it works. That's what humility is. It's thinking of others more highly than we think of ourselves. And it's evidence that we know Jesus Christ. And Isaac was a humble man, a very humble man. So as we get into this chapter, I'm going to go through it rather quickly, quite a few verses, but you'll get the story and you'll see what I'm talking about. We saw in chapter 25, Rebecca had twin sons. But here in chapter 26, the sons are not mentioned at all. And, and it's not because this chapter really goes before it. You know, it's probably because the focus isn't on the sons. Right now the focus is on Isaac and his sin. But yet God's grace, which is evidence in the Old Testament, even though uh, we look at the Old Testament at laws, we see God's grace working because of the humility of his people. So verses 1 through 5, we see this warning from God Isaac not to go to the land of Egypt which he also warned Abraham if you remember the story so therefore there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham verse 1 and Isaac went to Abimelech king of the Philistines in Gira then the Lord appeared to him and said do not go down to Egypt can't get any clearer than that and if you are my disciples you hear my voice and God said to Isaac, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Talk about direction. Talk about the Lord leading and guiding you and giving you the direction to exactly dwell in this place and don't go to any other place but there. Just dwell there. Verse 3, Dwell in the land. Or this land, and I will be with you and bless you for, you, for for to you, your descendants, I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, speaking of Jesus Christ, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And he's really talking about the humility of Abraham there, because we know that Abraham made big mistakes. We know that he sinned against his wife and God, but yet Abraham kept the Lord's commandments. Example, offering up his son Isaac as the Lord directed him. So, like father, like son, in a sense, with Isaac and Abraham doing the worst thing because of fear. The pressure of the famine in Canaan forced Isaac with his family and flocks to migrate into a land of the Philistines where he was exposed to personal danger. And it was the personal danger that forced him to lie about his relationship with his wife to Abimelech because of fear. 
Fear is an amazing thing. It will make you do some weird stuff. I was sharing that this morning about the fear of death. The fear of death. I met a lady who had a funeral and she was just such a positive person. She had cancer, her, shaved her head, she was completely bald, so you knew she had cancer. But she was happy about it, that she was going to defeat it, she was going to destroy it, and life was good, life was joyful, and she's out preaching because the man upstairs, she said, has given her the strength to defeat this cancer, and she's going to go on and, and be a testimony of defeating this, this crippling disease. And she goes out and she teaches at schools and places that you can do it too. You've got to have a positive attitude. And, and I was thinking in my head, like, well, I wish I had that kind of positive attitude just in life in general. But then the Lord says, yeah, but it's false. She's fearful of death. That's the problem. She's afraid to die. And that's why she has to be so positive about this life that she is living in now. And so she's afraid to die. And if she just thinks for one second that she's going to die, it's going to cripple her. But not so with the believers, right? Because our hope is in Jesus Christ and what He has done for us. And so God tells him, go and dwell in your land, but don't go down to Egypt. So Isaac lies about his wife. Look at verse 6. So Isaac dwelt in Gear. Now Gear, it's interesting because Gear is a place that's close to Egypt, but it's not quite Egypt. It's on the border of Egypt. And he's, he's kind of like just getting to the border of Egypt, getting close to Egypt. How far can I go before God says stop? You know. So he goes there to Egypt. And the men of that place asked about his wife. And he said, she's my sister. For he was afraid to say she is my wife because he thought at least the men of the place kill me for Rebecca because she, she is beautiful to behold. And so he uses the same tactics as his father did. Let me just lie about this and I'll be safe because he was fearful of his life. And now it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech king of the Philistines looked through a window and saw and there was Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah his wife. So he's dwelling there, prospering there, living among them, telling lies that this is my sister. They haven't done anything about it yet and Abimelech all of a sudden sees them and he sees them being intimate with one another because the word endearment really means caressing. It implies sexual intimacy. Not that they were in the act, but they were intimate with one another. And he's looking and going, wait a minute, something strange about this picture. I thought that this was his sister. Apparently, it's not his sister. It's somebody more than that. And Bimelech called Isaac and said, quite obviously, she is your wife. So how could you say she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, because I said, least I die on her account. You notice how open and clear and honest he is with Abimelech? He doesn't try to hide anything. Oh, no, 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 no that's not what I said. No, 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 you misunderstood me. No, 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 I meant this. You know, he says, no, I was fearful that you'd kill me, so I lied. He's very honest and open. Interesting that he would put her in that situation because it tr definitely is not a situation you want to put your wife into. And it's not biblical, first of all, because we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for the church. And so if anything, Isaac should have realized, I need to give my life for my wife. And if they take my life because of my wife, then so be it. God help me. I trust in God and he'll protect me. And, and really when you think about it, Isaac should have trusted that God would keep his promise. And if God promised me that I would prosper and the seed would come from the lineage of Abraham through Isaac and whoever the next person would be, then I know that he'll protect me. He'll watch over me. He'll never leave me or nor forsake me. So really what he should have done was had faith in God's promise to him, but he didn't. So Christ died on the cross for his bride and we are to die on our crosses for our brides. Sometimes it takes dying for your wife in order for them to live. 
But he didn't try to rationalize it, justify it. He just put a positive spin on that lie that he said to Abimelech. And Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might soon have laid with your wife and you would have brought guilt on us. Now, how did he know this? We know this Abimelech is not the same Abimelech of Abraham. This is an answer. Abimelech is a title. It's not his name. It's like president. And so it's his title. So this is a son of the other Abimelech. And obviously there's a record somewhere he read it or heard about the story with Abraham. And so now he realizes that this group of people of Abraham's uh, descendants is a blessed nation from God and you have to be very careful how you treat them. And so he says, you lied to me and someone could have laid with her and boy, you would have been, you would have brought guilt on us and we would have been a reproach to God. Same is true today with Israel, is it not? God has chosen Israel to be his people and we as a nation, as a people, should bless Israel. And we should take every opportunity to support Israel in whatever it is that they're doing and then the, at nation because they have been chosen by God. And so what Abimelech was saying was is that we need to be careful how we approach the Jews. They are chosen by God. You don't have to lie. We totally get that God is on your side. So because of his honesty, we see in verses 12 through 16 that the Lord begins to bless Isaac. And Isaac uh, sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him because of his honesty. So apparently Abimelech didn't really um, do anything to him because he lied to him, but just said, thank God that nothing has happened to us. He was more thankful than anything. And the man began to prosper and continue prospering until he became very proper, prosperous. You know, Isaac stumbled. He fell. But he got up and he went forward with God. And God prospered him because of that. The Christian walk is difficult. It's not an easy walk. I used to think it was easy because I was just so on fire for the Lord. Everything just was just fall into place. I was excited about it. And, and I really do think it is easy when you are excited about the Lord. But when you're living life, and you're just trying to get through life, it is difficult at times. You will have opposition from family. You'll have opposition from neighbors, from community. You, you'll always have opposition as long as the enemy is around. It's just the way that it is. And then on top of that is just the natural disasters of this world, sin. It's in this world. And so you'll have that opposition. And it's very easy to want to give up. But you can't. We don't really serve one another. We serve Christ. We love Christ. Christ called us. Christ saved us. Christ established us and given us eternal life. It's all his work and not ours. And so we should serve him, look to him, trust in him, depend on him, no matter if anyone else does or not. Because he is our Lord and our Savior. And so we should serve him 100%. So he was able to just get up and say, Hey, I messed up. I lied. But I'm going to still follow God. I will still trust him. I will still fulfill his plan for my life. I was talking with someone yesterday. And they were sharing with me about their struggles because of what they see in this world. It's just heartbreaking, they said. I, I just... I haven't gone to church. I have, I, it's hard for me to read my Bible because I see all this dishonesty, these lies and what's going on in the world and it's like it's hopeless it seems. I'm like, you need to get out of that because it's not hopeless. God is still on the throne and he's doing a work and you need to trust in him and it's not your work. It's not your responsibility. It's not your job to change this world. That's God's job. We're just to be faithful with what God gives us. With, God, with what God gives us. So Isaac's sin was exposed, he confessed, and he was blessed. And the man began to prosper, verse 13, and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. This is grace. May God be gracious to us if we are sincere 
with our faults before him. If we humbly walk before him, he said, he'll lift us up. He'll lift us up. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, and they had filled them with earth. So because of their envy, they began to sabotage Isaac's ministry. That's what people do when they're envious of you. A anytime people start attacking you, it's because of envy. Religious leaders envy Jesus because he had a message that was drawing crowds and they were losing crowds and so they envied him. They were angry. New Testament says they envied him too. And so they attacked him and then they crucified him. And people that envy other people of what they have, what they're doing, of the ministries they're involved in, that's sin. We shouldn't be envying one another. We should be encouraging. And if one is weeping, then we weep. If one is rejoicing, then we rejoice with them. We thank God. We're a part of the body of Christ and the body of Christ works together. I remember uh, one of the pastors in Fontana at the time <clears throat> he was talking to me and um, he said, so you're Roman's father? And I go, yeah, yeah, I'm Roman's father. He goes, man, he says, you did a good job. He goes, that, that young man came and helped us when we needed help. Didn't even go to our church and came and helped us. I'm like, well, praise the Lord. Wonder goes, yeah, I mean, I was blown away. That's what the body of Christ does. That's what the body of Christ does. We help one another. When one part is hurting, then the whole part is hurting, and we help the best that we can. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. So now he's fearing God and what God is doing in Isaac. The Philistines, you're going to see them as we continue on going in the Old Testament and David will end up fighting one of the Philistines. Uh, Philistines eventually moved there to Israel, the shores there of Israel, and because they were there, they started calling that land Philistine. And today, Palestine, it's called instead of Israel. And so you'll hear that word quite often being used as Palestine, Palestine. But in reality, it's God's land, and he has given it to the Israelites. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gear and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again uh, the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. So Isaac began to dig up those wells that his father and his servants had originally dug up. And he called them by the historical names that his father called them. The names of the wells by Abraham and the hereditary right of his family to the property. Because Abraham had dug them, it was their property and they had the right to take them. But the Philistines felt like they needed to move them out and began to stop them up. So Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. Now interesting the term there is spring or running water. And it's really, a proper translation would probably be living water. Living water. And so Isaac is being pushed out, and there's no water for him and his tribes, his herds, and so forth. And so he finds a well, and living water comes out. And it sustains his life, just like Jesus Christ does for us. And if any man thirsts and come after me, I will give him living water. The living water of God, and he'll sustain us. I love that living water because it always comes at the right time. When the enemy's kind of plugging up all the wells that we're accustomed to and used to, um, or when we're doing it ourselves because of our choices and so forth, God once in a while will all of a sudden allow us to dig a well. And living water will begin to flow once again. And we can partake of that grace of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. But the herdsmen of Gear quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Ex, because they quarreled with him. So this word in the Hebrew language means contention or challenge or quarrel. So it became a well of quarrel. They fought over it. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also. So he called it Shidduch, 
Shedeth means hatred or enmity or opposition. And he moved from there and dug another well. And they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth. Because he said, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. And that word, Rehoboth, means spacious or wide place. And it finally gotten far enough away that he found the peace of God in that land. Kind of speaks of our walk with the Lord at times, you know? Sometimes we're digging a well and we're trying to work things out and God just stirs things up. Just moves it around, stops it up so that we can move on to the next one and to the next one. And then he leads us and guides us. I was reading John Corson's testimony and it was, it was pretty interesting um, when he first, uh, he's been, he was a Christian pretty much all his life, but he was in a denomination and he was asked to teach at a youth camp. But at the youth camp he was teaching and he just didn't have a, a love for the kids. There was just something missing there, he was saying. He said, I just didn't love them and, and, and I didn't understand why and I didn't know how to. And he had been going to the Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, had begun going there and he thought, I'm just going to go there and talk to one of the pastors. And so the guy looked at him and said, what's wrong? And he, said, he shared with them and the guy said, oh, you just need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He said, let me lay hands on you. So he laid hands on him, the Lord filled him with the Holy Spirit and he went back and he goes, I had this love for the kids. And it just showed in his teaching he says, and then from there, that love just grew. But then one of the directors said, what are you doing differently? Because it just seems like you're doing something differently. You're bubbly, blah, blah, blah. He says, well, I went to Costa Mesa and I was telling them I just didn't have love. And they anointed me. I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And I go, oh, we don't believe that. We don't believe that here. Um, you're, you can stay because we need you. But don't, don't talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit at all. Otherwise, we'll have to let you go. And he dug a well there. And he, he wanted to do it so desperately to teach these kids, so he, he kept his word. Till one day, a couple of teachers came over and said, Hey, why are you so great at your teaching? What is going on? What, what is it that you know we don't know? And he's like, Oh, I'm not allowed to say. But he just felt like the Lord saying, Tell them. And so he prayed for them, and they received the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And needless to say, he had to go find another well to dig to. You know, and God does that. He moves you on and moves you on until finally you find peace. And then one day he's in a, a couple hear his teaching and say, hey, come down to Applegate. I want you to share with 25 people here. Just share with us. And he did. His wife loved it. And they've been there ever since. There's peace there. <clears throat> so Isaac finds that peace. Then he went up from there to Beersheba, verse 23, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. Notice the word I am. I am. I am the God. That, who, that is who our God is. It's used 64 times in the Gospel of John itself, speaking of Jesus Christ. John 8, 58, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you before Abraham was, I am. That is to exist. I existed in the beginning. And then you can turn to Exodus 3, 14, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. And in the Hebrew, it means to exist. And so Jesus was making a reference to himself in Exodus that he is the I am. And he is the I am of Isaac here. And he is the I am of us. He is. He exists. And he's there with us. And he'll never leave us or forsake us. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. And he pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug the well. Then Abimelech came to him from Ger and Ahus. One of his friends, Pichol, the commander of his army. And Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me since you hate me and have sent me away to them? So now he's not being really nice. He's now questioning them. Why are you here? Well, they're there because they want to make a treaty. And they're still a little scared of him. So he made a fast. And he ate and drank. And they arose early in the morning and sowed swore an oath with one another and Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in peace. Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's ways pleases the Lord, 
He makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. It is the humility of Isaac that is blessing him because he is trusting in the Lord. It came to pass again the same day that Isaac's servant came and told him about the well which they had dug and said to him, We have found water, so they called Sheba. Therefore the name of the city was Beersheba to this day, and we know it today even as Beersheba. Now we move on to Esau in five verses or so. It's a couple of verses here. It talks about Esau because what happened to Esau? Esau is Isaac's brother. And so it quickly tells us the deterioration of Esau here. Esau was 40 years old. He took as wives Judith, the daughter of Beri, Hittites, Bethmath, the daughters of Elon, the Hittite, and they were a grief of the mind of Isaac and Rebekah. And so <clears throat> Esau was a grief. Can children be a grief at times? Of course they can. Of course they can. When they're not walking with the Lord. And by the way, grief is not angry or anger at them. It's love. You can be grieved at someone's choices because you know they're making bad choices and they're going to have repercussions. doesn't mean you hate them. doesn't mean you don't love them. It's actually revealing that you do love them, that you even care that they're making bad choices. That's what children don't understand. When you're trying to correct a child, Oh, you just hate me. Oh, you just don't like me. Oh, you just don't want me to have this. No, no, on the contrary. You don't understand. I do like you. I do love you. I do care about you. You just want your way, and you're not going to get it because I do love you. You're going to get into trouble. Now, there, there's a process that God has to take them through in the, in the earlier parts. You have to really tell your kids what to do when they're younger. But when they get to a certain age, you have to start letting them make their own choices with some guidance. And then hopefully by the time they're 18, they'll be able to make good choices because at that point, they're free to make the choices good or bad. Good or bad. I've learned, at least for myself, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a, I'm not a marriage counselor in the sense. But I have learned that at that age, as a parent, as a grandparent, you have to let go and let God now be in control of their lives and their choices. You can try to force them. It's just not going to work. You'll probably push them away. There are times where they'll say things to you and you disagree and you just kind of smile and you go, okay, all right, that's fine. That's what Chuck used to do. And Dave Rosas would, would, would say that he'd go up to Pastor Chuck and say, I'm doing this and that. And Chuck goes, oh, okay. Well, that's wonderful. All right. And Dave's like, I, I didn't understand why I didn't get any response like I wanted. So he tried again. And Chuck said, oh, well, that's good, good. So he realizes, well, let me, let me ask it a different way. Chuck, what would you do in this case? And Chuck goes, oh, this is what I would do. Then I realized that he didn't agree with you, but he said, but if that's what you want to do, may the Holy Spirit be with you <laughs> when you do it. And so he realized that, Chuck, if this was you, what would you do? Oh, this is exactly what I'd do. And that's how he learned to get information from him. But I feel that that's true as parenting. When you watch your, your kids get married, when they have children, and they're making all those choices, that's their choices. That's, that's not my choice or Virginia's choice. It is their choice to raise their kids the way they want to. You're there to support them, encourage them. And if they ask for advice, then you give them the advice, if they even think you're wise enough uh, for that advice. Because <clears throat> at that age, you know everything, especially about parenting, because you know, you're now a new parent. I know everything about parenting. Okay. <laughs> I used to always think in my head as the boys were younger and they are raising their kids, I wait till they become teenagers and then see what you're going to go through. Believe me. Believe me. 
No, Rebecca and, and Isaac were grieved in the mind over what Esau had done. And how sad. It hurts a parent to see their children go off in air. It hurts deeply because of love. Let's close. So humility. Paul tells us, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility. And notice he says, as the elect. So if you're the elect... You are holy, you are loved, you need to put on humility. It's important that we walk in humility. God walked in humility. His disciples walked in humility. They had no regard for their lives whatsoever. And we are to walk in humility also. Andrew Murray, great writer, if you've ever read his book on prayers or any other books, very deep and intimate person and he says this humility is perfect quietness of heart it is to expect nothing to wonder at nothing that is done to me to feel nothing done against me it is to be at rest when nobody praises me and when I am blamed or despised. It is to have a blessed home in the Lord where I can go in and shut the door and kneel to my Father in secret. And I'm at peace as in a deep sea of calmness when all around and above is terrible. Think about that one for a while. That is humility, his definition. Thomas Kemp, who is that great painter, said, Let this be thy whole endeavor, this thy prayer, this thy desire, that thou mayest be stripped of all selfishness, and with entire simplicity follow Jesus only. That one really got me when I read that. <clears throat> if I can confess to you, before Forrest passed, I was tired. <laughs> With the injury, especially when that, that happened, just tired me out. And just a lot of... Same stuff that happens in the church. There's nothing different. But always the same stuff. I'm just tired. I, I had given up. I've given up. And just, whatever, Lord, I'm just going to go through the motions. And reading that scripture, and feeling and experiencing what Forrest was going through in my early life. I mean, exactly. I can remember just simply loving Jesus. And nothing else mattered. Nothing else mattered. And I want that back so badly right now. I want to just simply focus on Him and forget everything else. And just let the Lord move the way He wants to move. And if people want to follow, that's fine. If people don't, that's fine too. Just totally trust in Him. The simplicity of Jesus. Just simply following Jesus. That's what made Pastor Chuck so amazing, is that he simply followed Jesus. He didn't care what people thought about him. He wasn't impressed with people at all. In reading John Corson's testimony, he said that uh, he was so impressed with Pastor Chuck. He wrote him a letter. He said, Pastor Chuck, I've been going to your church this long. And I want you to know that I went to seminary school. And these are my, these are my accolades. And this is what I've done. This is what I've done. done. And he sent it off to him. He said, that evening, Pastor Chuck is up there teaching. And I'm sitting there listening. And Chuck says, you know... I get people writing me letters all the time about all the things they've done. <laughs> goes, you, you don't push your way into the ministry. You don't fight to get a position or a place. That's not of the Lord. Humility. Humility, the Bible says, will give you a position. And John says, I shrunk down in my chair like he was looking at me. Oh, what an idiot. What a knucklehead. And he goes, oh, I was just torn apart. Like, how could I do something so dumb? And 
you know, so forth. He was totally broken and humiliated at that point. So he learned humility. And he said it wasn't a couple of weeks later uh, that he tried to make an appointment with him, and it took about seven weeks before Chuck saw him. And he walked in there, and immediately he was ready. Chuck, I'm sorry. I apologize. I learned my lesson. And Chuck says, John, we'd like you to be the professor up at the Bible college. And he was like, what? <laughs> he was just totally surprised. Because Chuck, I really believe, could see the anointing on someone also. <sighs> Simply follow Jesus.